Well, here we are looking at um, Guercino's painting of uh, St. Luke painting uh, the Virgin and Child, or St. Luke at the Easel. And this is an interesting painting to talk about from several respects. Luke was a Luke was one of the four evangelists. Right? Luke right. was Matthew, one of the Mark, Luke, and John. He, he was one of the, the four gospels. evangelists writing one of the four gospels uh, that makes up the uh, Christian Bible. Um, but and he was also a painter. Apparently. He was also believed to be a painter, and um, Christians at the time and some today believe that he had actually painted firsthand images of Christ and the Virgin Mary. Um, mm. and so he, for that reason, is also the patron saint of artists, um, mm -hmm. because he was mostly known as being, um, an evangelist, but yeah. was also thought of as being a painter. You know, it makes me think about the whole sort of Christian tradi tradition of making images and this desire to sort of have the image connect directly to Christ and the apostles and to Mary and not to have any distance between the image and, and the reality. Absolutely. Um, and so this painting is interesting from that respect in that it, it shows Luke as an artist. Um, we also see in the background this inkwell uh, with the cow or bull that is the allegorical symbol for St. Luke mm -hmm. uh, sitting on top of a book, which we have to assume is the Gospel of St. Luke, one of the books of the Bible. Right. Uh, and so it shows him in this, in this dual respect. And in that sense, it's almost a rather traditional representation of St. Luke. But it's also interesting because we could talk about this as a very good example of uh, Baroque painting uh, from the 17th century. This is from the 1650s, uh, because as in other Baroque paintings that had started developing in the late 1500s, we have uh, very naturalistic figures, a sense of classicizing figures and architecture and clothing. Um, everything is relatively simple. There's not a lot of things going on in the painting. We have large figures in the foreground. There's not a lot of distracting things in the background. There's a rational sense of space and depth and light and so on. And mm -hmm. for all these respects, it, formally speaking, is a pretty traditional Baroque painting. Right. That makes sense. Uh, but what's maybe most interesting about this painting is how we can also think of it to a certain extent as a counter-reformation painting. Um, sort of reaffirming the importance of images for the church? Absolutely. For the Catholic Church, we can think of this painting as a response that the Catholics are giving mm -hmm. toward the Protestant Reformation. Uh, for many decades at this point, for over a hundred years, the Protestant Church, especially in Northern Europe, had been criticizing the Catholics for many aspects of their devotion and religious practice, but one of the main targets of the Protestant critics was religious art. And in fact, religious images were being destroyed in, in Protestant countries. In some parts, they were going around tearing paintings down, gouging out sculptures' eyes, mm -hmm. uh, smashing destroying and destroying images of saints, things. Right. Exactly, because generally speaking, the criticism was that um, art was not good, according to the Protestants, for religious purposes, because it was distracting. You would be distracted by the artist's skill, or the beauty of the painting, or the eroticism of the figures. And you could even be fooled into worshipping the image itself instead of the, the ideas behind the image. The Protestants said that was a great, great danger, mm -hmm. that you'd be so astounded by a you know, painting by Leonardo that you would end up worshiping the image well, more and, than their message it was trying to convey. And that does happen. You know, Absolutely. People worship images and think that they have magical powers. And so rather than images, the Protestants had said uh, the primary focus of your devotion, the primary tool for devotion and religious meditation should instead be text, the word of the actual Bible itself. And that's just saying that in and of itself is an attack on the church. Because Absolutely. one of the things that they were saying was that the church, in all of its practices and rituals, had gotten away from what Christ actually wrote mm -hmm. in the Bible and encouraged a kind of going back and a close reading of, of the real text, not just listening to the words of the priest and the practices of the church. Right. Um, saying that the authority was the text itself, it was written about Christ, rather than some pope. pope or archbishop right. telling you what to think. a pretty radical thing to say. It was very radical. That's why they got in so much trouble originally. Big trouble. <laughs> so in any case, after decades of this Protestant criticism in the Protestant churches, the Lutherans, the Calvinists, and so on, are growing stronger and stronger, the Catholic Church needed to formulate its response beginning in the mid-1500s, and this is the period known as the Counter-Reformation. And one of the things that the Catholics do in the Counter-Reformation is... And the Counter-Reformation means against the Reformation. Exactly. It's the Catholic response to the Protestant Reformation. Some people even call it the Catholic Reformation rather mm -hmm. than the Protestant Reformation. Um, so one of the main points of the Catholic Counter-Reformation is that 
they're justifying the use of art. Mm -hmm. um, they're saying that art is an important religious tool. Yes. And one of the most straightforward reasons that they claimed it was, was that, of course, even though literacy had grown tremendously, still most people did not know how to read. And so the Catholics respond to the Protestants, how can we tell people that the Bible is their main devotional tool if they can't okay. even read mm -hmm. and if books are still relatively rare objects? Mm -hmm. Instead, they say, the Catholics, that religious images, altarpieces in churches, devotional images in your house, these are more useful than books because everyone can understand what they're about. Mm -hmm. They're immediately accessible. You don't have to know how to read. And as some people still say today, a picture can be worth a thousand words. You can communicate things with images that are impossible to communicate with written words on the page. Yeah. So here in this painting, what we have is not only a celebration of a painter, St. Luke, according to Catholic belief, but this is really a very pointed, a very rhetorical defense of painted religious images. And it even suggests that painting is even more important mm -hmm. than the written word. Um, let's talk about how we see that in this painting. Well, of course, we have St. Luke sitting at the easel with his palette and brushes, and look how he turns looks at the viewer and gestures towards his painting of the Virgin and Child, as if to say, look at what I'm doing. This is what I'm painting. And in the background, we have an angel looking over his shoulder, looking pleasantly at the painting, representing divine approbation, right. uh, as if God and the angels in heaven Wanted is looking to, right. on approvingly right. as St. Luke is painting like this painting. God inspired the, the Gospels, so God inspired the paintings. Absolutely, or at least mm -hmm. approves of them. Mm -hmm. uh, but then what else do we see in the painting? Remember, of course, in a Baroque painting, nothing is included accidentally or for no reason. And when we look over at the right side, here. As we mentioned, there's this inkwell in the book. But he's turned his back on them. The pen is in the inkwell, the book is closed, mm -hmm. there's this weight on top of it, and as you said, he's literally turned his back on the written word in order to focus on the painting. And you know, when you look at this, you you know, you, and you think, oh, Mary and, and the Christ child and this devotional image to inspire prayer, and you think, well, which is going to inspire prayer? This? <laughs> right. Or, this, well, this works for me. Exactly. It's a very, very rhetorical image. We need mm -hmm. to understand this painting in terms of the dialogue, the conflict between the Protestants and the Catholics, in terms of the Protestants saying, focus on the text, and the Catholics defending the use of images. Mm -hmm. We should also add that the Protestants liked St. Luke quite a lot, even though generally they were a little bit averse to the cult of saints. Uh, they did like St. Luke as well as the other evangelists because he was a writer. So here we have the Catholics celebrating him as a painter. It's as if they're saying, look, Protestants, you like St. Luke. You think he's a great hero because he was a writer, but he was also a painter. And therefore you mm -hmm. cannot criticize painting because one of the great of heroes painting. of the church mm -hmm. uh, was a painter and made mm -hmm. religious images according mm -hmm. to their belief. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, it's, it's this con the church continually needing to sort of justify throughout its history at mm -hmm. different moments the use of images Absolutely. and, and their, their power. And this image just speaks to that so it's perfectly. It's a very good example of that.